So yeah, um, when, I, when I read the annotations for the papers we love meetup, it says that it's about computer science and papers. I'm going to break all the, all the rules, and this is a book, here's a real copy, and it's not about computer science. Um, but I, think still, I, I still think it's relevant, um, and it's sort of, when I was, when I was in, in Cambridge, the PhD only takes like three or four years, and when I was in the last year, as every PhD student, I sort of started thinking, hmm, what am I actually doing here? Uh, not in the sort of meaning of life sense, but more in the work sense. Um, and I sort of, I found it really interesting to read some of the philosophy of science works because they're doing exactly that. They're like trying to un understand how science works, how, like, what's the right way of reasoning, um, how should we do things, and how does science actually work if you look at it from the historical perspective. And so this is one of the books that I found just so refreshing when you're like, when you spend three years writing equations, um, this is the book you should read. Um, and I think it could have pretty much the same effect on people who do a lot of computer science or programming in general. And I'll start with just a like, brief context. And um, it fits in this philosophy of science discipline. And um, philosophy of science, it's sort of inspired by the idea that if you look at how physics has been doing over the last 100, 300 years, it worked pretty well. Like, we know a lot of things about physics. And that's because physics find this, found this nice method called the scientific method. And if we should, if other disciplines want to sort of get as far as physics got, they should also, we should understand what is this scientific method. Like, why, why, does, the, why does it actually work? And learn how to apply it. And so that's the idea that sort of inspired some of philosophy of science. Um, and that means we sort of want to understand what's the method, how people actually work, how we build sort of correct theories, how we, how we learn how to verify the theories. Um, but it also means looking at the history and seeing what people did sort of scientific, what scientific work happened and what can we learn from that. And I think there's, there's not much that has been done on sort of philosophy and history of computer science specifically, just because it's not really that old. There's some really interesting work done on, on history of computer science, um, but I think there's a lot more that could be done in that area. So what I'm going to do here is I'll talk mainly about Paul Feyerabend's book, and I'll have various side notes linking it to ideas from computer science where I think it makes some sense. Yes? How do we know that the scientific method works? That's a really good question, and that's one of the questions that's questioned here as well. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of things in that area. I just picked some of the books I like, so this is not like an organized scheme, but if you want to read some nice book, here's a bunch of them. Um, and one of the really early ones was Karl Popper, who came up with this idea of falsification. So what he said is, if you're proposing a scientific theory, it's only scientific if it can be falsified. So if you're proposing a theory, it's only science if there is a way that it can be invalid. If you're saying something that can't be invalidated, that's not science. Um, and then a few people reacted to this. Uh, Thomas Kuhn with his scientific revolutions, uh, he sort of looked at this nice ra rational way of building science and said, well, actually, sometimes this is not how it looks. And if you look at history, there's, there's moments where just 
kind of people start thinking about stuff completely, in a completely different way. Um, so this is what sort of happens in Copernican revolution, uh, what Newton does, uh, what happens with the theory of relativity. You just have to kind of not really throw away everything, but it's more like rephrasing everything that has been done before and building a new ground underneath. Um, Lakatos, uh, with research programs, um, follows kind of similar idea, uh, but he says if you look at science overall, there's just, at any single moment, there's multiple research groups or research programs where they have some basic assumptions that they're never going to question. And uh, that's kind of against what Popper was saying, where he, he said, anything you should be able to question, anything must be falsifiable. In reality, scientists don't really question everything. Right? They always have some core assumptions that's just never false. Like, whenever, if you were getting to the dangerous area, you'll always find some side condition. Um, like, you, I guess in, in you, could, you could sort of say in pure functional programming, you have a core assumption that you can write any code without using mutation. And if you need to write some efficient hash table, you'll just say, ah, it's not, it's not that I should use mutation here. It's just that the compiler must do a better optimization. <laughs> so that's another, that's another fun thing there. And Feyerabend goes even further. And um, he's, you'll, you'll see that in the rest of the talk. Uh, and the last one I put here, that's also, I find that also interesting because that's more looking at how, um, if you look at science from the historical perspective, or if you look at how, if you think what has been done in science and how computers were invented, we have this very ideal picture of how just everything followed very nicely, linearly towards the, the greater, the, the ultimate truth. And this book is looking at how it actually works when it's building. Um, so that's another sort of, another, another point against this beautiful idea of how perfect science is. Um, and so in, in Paul Feyerabend's book, he has this, um, phrase or slogan, which is probably the one, the one thing to remember if you don't want to remember it quite well, or if you, if you want to have slightly skewed picture of the book, then this is the thing to remember. Um, but he says, to those who look at the rich material provided his, by history, and I had to truncate it to fit it on the slide, but it also says, so to those who look at the rich material provided by history and who are not intent of impoverish impoverishing it in order to please their lower instincts, <laughs> their craving for intellectual security in the form of clarity, precision, objectivity, and truth, it will become clear that there is only one principle it can be, that can be defended under all circumstances and in all stages of human development. It's the principle anything goes. I just wanted to read it because that shows you how enjoyable the book is. <laughs> um, and he isn't really saying that there's no order whatsoever. Um, he had a clarification later where he says, it's not really that this is, that I'm saying there should be no order. I'm just saying, um, if you look at the history, there's no single principle that always applies. Um, and there are various principles that work in some cases, and when scientif scientists do work, um, they follow some principles, always. But there's just no single unifying principle behind everything. And that's kind of against this, against this idea that Physics follows this beautiful scientific method that we can just understand and copy. Feyerabend says there's no, no such thing. Um, and he does two things in the books. Um, 
One is that he has his humanitarian uh, argument where he just tries to explain why is it better for science, for mankind, and for everyone. Um, but he also has this historical perspective, uh, which is mostly around Galileo Galilei and how he managed to convince scientists that heliocentrism is the right, is the right way of modeling the universe. Um, and I guess when you, when you think of Galileo Galilei, many people think of it as this genius scientist who was right and won over the church who were just following some orthodoxy and were obviously wrong. Um, and what's really interesting in the Fire Abend's book is that he actually tries to understand it more from a historical perspective and tries to understand what was scientific back then and how Galileo actually in many and many places didn't really follow <coughs> the scientific method of the time. Um, so uh, he has again a beautiful quote. So Galileo of course has some intellectual reasons, there's some, there's some good motivation for it, but he also uses propaganda and psychological tricks to convince people of his model. Um, and there's a, there's a number of really interesting cases there. So um, something that Fire Abend calls, calls natural inter interpretations, which is sort of what you just believe in without heavy thinking. Like that's the background. And on top of that, you can, you can do science and think. Um, well, so if you were living in that, in that time, the first argument against the claim that the Earth is moving is that you don't feel it. Like, I go outside, nothing's moving with me, I'm just standing, there's no, like, I don't feel the movement. And uh, if you were living in a world where everyone believes that the Earth, Earth doesn't move, um, then that's a very valid point, because if you get on a horse carriage and it starts moving, you can feel it, right? Um, so the fact that you don't feel it is the first sort of natural interpretation that Galileo has to break and convince you that actually it, ca it can be moving even though you don't feel it. Um, the other argument against mov movement of Earth was the idea that if, you're, if you climb on a large tower and you throw a stone, then if the Earth was rotating, then the stone would fall somewhere further or closer to the, to the tower. And again, I, in, his, in the model that people believed in back then, this is a perfectly valid point. And so what sort of Galileo has to do is that he has to invent a completely new story about how the world works. And uh, the interesting bit there is that he actually has to combine two things at the same time. So it's not like you could add one thing and clarify how things work and add one more and get closer to the, to the right model. You just have to convince everyone that everything is different. You have to, you have to come up with the idea that every movement is relative and um, if, uh, if, you, if you are on the Earth and the whole, the whole Earth is moving, you don't have to feel it. Um, and he also has to come up with the idea that if the, the, earth, the, the tower is rotating and the stone is thrown from the tower, it will continue rotating with the tower. Um, and this is, this is like one place where you're not just doing small addition to the, to the scientific image, you just have to change the whole story. So that's what Fire Abend calls natural interpretations, and that's sort of the, the background on top of which we're, we're thinking or doing science. And um, I think this is kind of related to uh, Imre Lakatos, who has the research programs where you also have these like basic assumptions that you're never questioning. And I think this is a very common idea in computer science, 
I already talked about the pure, pure functional programming where um, we are never going to question the idea that uh, we never need mutation. Uh, there's, there's a bunch of other things, like whenever you're modeling some computation in, in, pro, in functional programming, we have a mo method for that, and that's called monads. So we are going to just use monads without really thinking about it too much. Um, there is there's one nice uh, piece of work or development that happened when people uh, started modeling data flow computations. Um, there was uh, a programming language called Lucid, and someone came up with a semantics for it that was built using monads, because monads is how you model computations. And then uh, later on, there was another paper that said, well, actually, this is silly. Monads aren't helpful at all for this. Um, and they came up with, an, with, a, with another model um, that was ironically based on the dual, so it was based on comonads. Um, but it was one of those cases where we just follow some basic assumptions that tell us how to do things or how to understand things, um, and it's sort of obscuring other possible directions. Um, and another, and this is something that a lot of people in the academic programming languages world have. Uh, if you're talking about types and type systems, type systems are these sound things that prevent errors. And then you have someone who comes up with language like Dart or TypeScript that aren't doing this at all. Um, and I think that's another, that's another case where the sort of natural interpretation could be slightly shifting, or there's, there's people breaking that idea, and you might think they're just crazy and lunatics, um, or maybe they're actually doing science like everyone else. Um, the, other interesting book, the other interesting thing in the book is uh, how Galileo uses telescope to convince people of, um, of his model, and uh, the first thing here is that when, they built, when he built the first telescope, it was really imperfect. Um, and it was the, the images you would get from it were in conflict with what you can see in your, with your eye. Like it was stretching some things. Uh, it wasn't accurate. There were like you wouldn't see clearly. And I guess if you think about this from our modern perspective, like we are used to the idea that if you have imperfect lens, it will distort the image a bit. And we kind of know in what ways. Like we know it can make things shorter or, or longer, but it will never hide something or add something to the image. But that's something they didn't have. So if you looked through the first telescope and it was distorting the image, you would be like, well, this is not how it looks, right? It, why, it could be adding things, removing things, adding reflections, whatever. So um, whenever, whenever sort of people say, Galileo built a telescope, and now he had this perfect tool for convincing everyone that um, the world is how he thinks, well, the telescope didn't work. Like, it was, it was we, only, we only understood how it works later when we built more perfect versions of it and we provided the additional theory. So even, even the telescope was kind of fishy. And it goes, it's even worse with the telescope. So the other problem with the telescope is that back then, the, the established scientific fact was that celestial and terrestrial objects are actually completely different things. Um, they are made from different materials, they obey different laws. So nowadays we have no problem in believing that if um, you test the telescope on the Earth, on the ground, and it makes things bigger, it will also make bigger, it will also make, make celestial things bigger. But that's something that just wasn't true back then because the, the scientific reality that was just part of how people thought about the world 
was that there's, there's terrestrial objects and celestial, and they're different parts, different things. Um, so this is again where, where Galileo actually had to do a lot of propaganda to convince people that it makes sense to use the telescope on the stars. Um, and I think I have one more, one more point on Galileo, which is, um, which is, again, I think, really interesting for people in computer science. Um, and that's when uh, Feyerabend says that um, the language in which we express our observations may need to be changed as well, so that the, the new observations that Galileo is reporting aren't sort of mixed with the assumptions that you have about the old, coming from the old observations. So when you're making observations, you're expressing, expressing that in some terms that are partly based on your baseline theory. And if you want to change the theory, you kind of have to come up with a new way of describing the observations as well. Like you, you have to come up with new terminology that doesn't distinguish between the celestial and the terrestrial objects and so on. Um, and I think this, this idea of, of language and um, how you have to carefully avoid, uh, with, uh, avoid mixing what you're doing in the new theory with what's known in the old theory is something that matters in computer science as well. Um, there's, I think, one, one kind of funny but interesting example is um, in F-sharp, there's this thing called computation expressions, um, which you can kind of think, think about it as syntactic sugar for monads. And every time um, someone talks about computation expressions in, in F-sharp in front of Haskell, Haskell familiar audience, they get the question, so is this just monads? And uh, on, the, on some technical level, they're very closely related, and the answer might be yes. Um, or to some extent, it's not quite that. There's, there's um, technical differences as well. But also, if you, if you just use different names, it gives you the freedom to build whole new understanding and intuition around it. Because monads is like, very, I guess, poison, poisonous word. Like it has this massive amount of assumptions and basic ideas around it that you can't say this is all wrong because it's not. But if you want to talk about something that has different intuition around it, you just have to use different language. Um, I had another interesting case. Um, where um, in some of the f -sharp type providers, I called something union type because it had some shared structure with what's normally called union types. Um, and in one of the reviews, I got beautiful comments saying, this is just all wrong because this is not what union types should be like. And um, again, this was, I think, like, I picked the word because I saw the similarity. They just didn't see the, similar, the same similarity I would see there. And again, it's one of those structures that has a lot of assumptions around it, how it should work. Um, so I guess what's the, what's the important thing to learn from the book here, at least for me, is that when we talk about things, the language is actually really important. Like, when I'm, when I'm using some word, I'm not just getting the, the technical definition or some core of the idea, but I'm getting all the infrastructure around it. Um, so that's another sort of inspiration that I think is really well described in the book. And um, what Feyerabend in the end says about the Galileo trial is that when the Inquisition came to um, see if what he was saying is sensible or not. Um, they declared the doctrine to be foolish and absurd in philosophy, which was 
Back then, a way of saying this is unscientific. Um, and uh, based just on what was the, the scientifically established fact of the time, they concluded that he was just wrong. Um, and this is, not, this is not criticism of Galileo. Like, I'm not saying... I'm not saying he was wrong, obviously, but I think it's a good example that shows how sometimes um, what is scientific isn't necessarily, or what's <coughs> unscientific, well, I think I have it on the next slide, right? Unscientific doesn't necessarily mean wrong. It might be correct, it's just that the science doesn't have the right method to explain it, or doesn't have it yet. It might, and it will, it will Generally, like, it will just take a bit longer until we build more tools, more theories, more machinery, and then it will be right and scientific. But there's this phase where things can be actually right, but not scientific, because even science has some limitations. Um, and the usual, the usual amazing Feyerabend quote is that science is much more sloppy and irrational than its methodological image. So we like to think that science is perfect and scientists always have the right answers. They're getting closer to the truth. And I think what Feyerabend demonstrates here with the Galileo case is that actually it's not that easy. Next question? Yeah, so are you implying that scientific necessarily is right? Am, am I implying that scientific necessarily means right? Um, <laughs> We'll have to give you mic, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but by the same token, um, Bruno got burnt at the stake um, for uh, pretty much um, uh, the heliocentric uh, view. So to say that Inquis Inquisition science uh, is like a predate, and it's more, I think you don't, right now we don't burn people at the stake usually for scientific mistakes. No, we just don't give them tenure. <laughs> right, but, but in a certain sense, I see, a, I see most of his argument is basically um, general science coming under the pressure of the insights of Heisenberg and Gödel. All right. Um, well, I, so I, th I don't think we... Yeah, I definitely agree we don't burn people anymore. Um, <laughs> but I think as, as far as like, scientific reasoning can be judged back then, um, there's, there's definitely some very valid point. The, the previous thing, do I say that scientific is, is right? Yeah, I, I think there's, well, I definitely, I definitely think there is some value in the term scientific, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it for my PhD, right? Um, and I think even, even back then, they had some notion of correct reasoning, like correct way of thinking and deducing truth and yeah so it wasn't the modern science obviously but it was um and again the, the argument here isn't really whether the um whether the inquisition like should should have should have uh banned galileo from publishing his writings it actually goes the other way around. It's more like, um, even, even back then, what we now think that that's the perfect scientific approach, if you look a bit more carefully, it wasn't scientific according to uh, the best idea of what would have been scientific back then. Which was Aristotelian methodology. Which was Before Aristotelian methodology. Yeah, which was Aristotelian methodology, methodology that worked pretty well up to that point. Yeah. Yep. So 
So am I saying that the Inquisition wasn't making a mistake by the standards of that time? Um, and as, as uh, bad as the times were, I think that was their methodology. And equally, if you, if you are following the, the modern scientific method, um, or if you are not following the modern scientific method and you're in the, in the, yeah, if you're not following the modern scientific method, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong. Um, just like back then, if Galileo wasn't following the scientific method of back then, it didn't mean he was wrong. One more, and then I'll uh, have more things to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think... Uh, flat Earth was not an issue. It was that's a different... Yeah, whether the Earth is flat, that's another question. This is whether it's moving or not. But I think we know it now, hopefully. That would be... Yeah, whether... whether what's useful heuristic? Um, so there was actually another really interesting thing about Galileo, which is that his mathematical models based on his model when he was predicting the positions of planets, it was actually less accurate than the earlier models because they just added more epicycles to it to make it work. All right, so I think that was, that was a good discussion at the end of one section, so perfect timing. And um, I have one more section, or actually a few more sections. Um, so there are a few sort of concrete points in the Against Method book where um, Feyerabend talks about some of the concrete scientific methods or requirements and tries to explain why they may be too restrictive or not always right. And uh, there's, there's uh, two points. One is that the, met the model he's saying where you should be you shouldn't be necessarily strictly following one method, that's theoretical anarchism, is more humanitarian and is more likely to encourage progress. So that's the idea that if we are not that strictly, if we not, don't strictly follow, require everyone to follow the right rules, the correct procedures, then actually it's better for science. And he kind of has it from the historical perspective and also from his humanitarian belief that it's just better for people. Um, and one of the sort of concrete points that you can, you can find in science is the consistency condition, which is the idea that if you're proposing a new hypothesis, it has to be consistent with the existing accepted theories. So if we have some theory about how the world works, and I come up with a new idea, that has to be consistent. And um, what Feyerabend says, why this is limiting, is that it just means that the theory that appears first, for whatever reason, is the one that we'll have to build on. If there's some slightly different theory that we could build on as well, that's partly inconsistent with the one we accepted, then that's just Bad luck, you came too late. Um, and I guess this is, again, something you can find in, in various places in computer science and programming, where when someone comes up with some... Um, now, I'm not using framework in the programming sense. With some methodological framework for thinking about stuff, you will sort of be forced or will have to fit with that model. You'll have to describe what you're doing in that context. And uh, I think that's, that's, again, something where we maybe sometimes should, be, should, be, should learn to live with just multiple basic explanations that are not consistent. Um, and so that's what Feyerabend summarizes here when he says the methodological unit to which we must refer is a whole set of partly overlapping, factually adequate, but mutually inconsistent theories. So it is fine if there's multiple basic, assum multiple basic assumptions about something that just don't 
work together because we don't know which one is better. And uh, there's no single truth. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll use an example with types and type systems because I think if you, if you ask like two different people what's a type and type system, if you pick the right people, they can end up in a fight. Um, if, you, if you, for example, take like Dart and TypeScript and someone who does Idris, the Dart and TypeScript people are like, well, types, it's just like a documentation, helps, helps with tooling. And the Idris people are like, no, no, it's, it's proving that your program is correct. How can you prove that your program is correct if you have holes in your type system? And that's a nice example where we just have multiple inconsistent theories where people just don't really share the same, the same background for things. Yes? Now, would that be more uh, <coughs> holes in their background with relation to the language being used in that case? Would it be a hole in their background with, in terms of how the language is used? Um, I don't think so. I, like, you could say they're, they're actually right. They just shouldn't fight. <laughs> like, they, they just have different idea about what a type is. They have different basic assumptions. And what I'm sort of saying here is that we should just learn to accept the fact that the other people might have different core assumptions, um, which is really hard. Like, if I have some core assumption that I'm never willing to question, I, I'm not willing to question it. Um, and so I think there's, there's um, it's more that we should just expect that maybe there's the, 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 the structure of the science is that there's just inconsistencies. Yep. Where did the uh, inconsistency principle come from? Where did the inconsistency principle come from? Where, the, the consistency. Yeah, the consistency principle is from like ancient Greece. So I think it's like from Aristotle or someone. It's definitely not a modern scientific idea. No, it's from Aristotle. So that's uh, pretty old. Yes? With regard to the programming languages, is there, there are practical consequences of choosing one idea over another. In other words, you choose one idea, you may build a program that programs solve certain problems more easily or more reliably. Yeah. So in the, in the programming languages, there's definitely practical consequences of choosing one or another. Um, and um, I think it's, it's probably the case with um, different inconsistent models of how the, how the Earth and the planets are moving as well. Because in one case, you'll be able to predict something better. In another case, you'll be able to predict something else better. Or and or with types... Celestial navigation might become easier in one than the other. Yeah, so in, in types also it pretty much just means that I'll get some properties easier in one model and in another model I'll get some, pro some other properties but not maybe the first ones. And uh, yeah, I think that's true. Um, so that was, that was um, how we talk about theories. Um, it goes, there's, there's uh, another really interesting thing about empirical observations. And that's the idea that, again, when, um, so when we make some empirical observations about, in Galileo's case, about the celestial movements and so on, um, we very often just need to wait and ignore the large masses of critical observations um, and uh, wait until we actually have the right framework or the right model that can explain them. So if we have some new theory, it will very often just be inconsistent not with other theories, but also with empirical observations. Um, so you have a new theory, and it just doesn't, doesn't match with your measurements. 
Even that, according to Feyerabend, isn't a reason to say it's stupid. It just means you have to look at how the measurements are obtained, like what tools are you using, are you actually, is there something you're missing in the other assumptions about the tools? Um, and I do think I have a nice, pr nice programming language example here, because if you looked at the first purely functional programming languages, um, they were not able to read from the console. They were not able to read from a file. What kind of language is this? And if we just, if we just followed our empirical observation that in this programming language, I can't do anything, we would just throw it away immediately. But we didn't do that. Instead, we were not behaving according to the right scientific method. We just kept working on it until we figured out that actually, if you, pro if you build some other mechanisms, um, like monads, then it actually we can make it work as well. And it was just initial observation that you can't write to a file. But when you, when you spend more time on the theory, even though it initially looks like we should just throw it away, it might start making sense. Um, and one last thing in this, in this um, section, um, and this is again a beautiful quote. Um, so Feyerabend says that to clarify the terms doesn't mean to study the additional properties, but it means to um, sort of take the, take, the idea, take the idea you have and instead use methods and ideas from another domain which has the right, which has the right level of clarity and uh, fill that into our, our new model. Um, so if I, if I come up with something that's very unclear and fuzzy and um, I'm, I need to clarify it and say, talk about it precisely, um, that's something that if you have that requirement at the beginning, uh, it's really hard because it just takes so long to build the theories and instead, um, if you have something unprecise and you want to make it, and, and you have to make it clear, um, what usually happens is that you just, instead of building the additional theory on top of your idea, you just change your idea and shift it into a space where adding the clarity is easy. Um, and I do think this is something that happens in, in programming language research where uh, very often, people come up with some idea and they start with some initial problem and it's unclear. Um, to publish a paper, we need some nice mathematical theory and proofs and so we'll start building that and as we are doing it, we're actually going to change the motivation. We are going to do it a bit differently and now it's no longer really resembling the original problem but it's something that can be nicely clarified and proved and published. Um, and uh, Feyerabend says, so the course of an investigation is deflected into the narrow channels of things already understood. Um, because the, the clarity requirement just forces you to use certain methods that have worked before in one area and everything sort of ends up going into the same, into the same area, the same sort of structure. Um, yeah, so I think this is, this is a beautiful quote. As someone who did, uh, who spent three, ta three years working on programming language theories, uh, this resonates very well. Um, so that was the concrete sort of against method points that, that Feyerabend makes um, against the, the, some of the requirements of, I guess, what's more of the modern scientific method. Like the Galileo that was, that was talking about ancient history, but I think a lot of the things in this section were actually talking about modern science as well. Um, and there's a few, few more things in Feyerabend's theoretical anarchism. How could we, how could we, or how does the science 
actually work if, if you look under the cover and if you look under this perfect um, aura that, that science has around it that protects it from everyone who says, uh, are you really that perfect? Um, and so if you, look, if you look under the cover, um, then uh, where can we find alternative theories, alternative ideas? Uh, you can take them from the past. Um, you can take them wherever you, wherever you find an inspiration. Like you can use ancient myths, or you can use uh, fantasies of cranks to find some interesting ideas that maybe will be the basis of your, of your future theories that eventually will become precise, clear, and uh, will, will work with the actual empirical observations. Um, and I, it sounds really funny when you read the quote, but if you look at some of these great people and where they found some of the ideas, um, it's actually, there's, there's quite a lot of surprising things. So Charles Babbage, um, we think he just appeared in like 200 years before everyone even knew what a computer is, and he just had this beautiful idea of computer. Um, so Charles Babbage was actually inspired by Adam Smith and his idea of division of labor, um, which I just find really amazing. Um, so the, the, the idea here was that Adam Smith had the idea that um, there should be sort of smaller number of people doing the really hard, like the, 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 the hardest piece, the, more int the, the most intellectual challenging part of the, of the work, like organizing everything. Then there's a next layer where people do more mechanical tasks, and there's the workers at the bottom who just do completely mechanical tasks. And Babbage just took it literally. And he said, well, actually, mechanical, right? We have the steam engine. We could build it. Um, and it was partly also inspired by um, the, the French statisticians, uh, like when, when, the, when the French, I don't know what was the government back then, but they wanted to, um, calcu they, they wanted to calculate uh, the, the tables that Babbage was calculating with a difference engine. Um, and they followed the same algorithm that Babbage followed in the difference engine, except they had people at the bottom. And um, so Charles Babbage found his inspiration in a completely different area. Um, Ada Lovelace, who um, people like to think as the first programmer, and I never really like it because I think that's just, like, she was much better than that. <laughs> um, because she was really inspired by poetry and music. And you probably wouldn't be able to invent programming if you were not taking really crazy ideas together. Um, and so, um, yeah, Ada Lovelace, he, she also referred to her, herself as poetic scientist. Um, and it was just another amazing example where you take a lot of different ideas, and one of her one of her writings was how the, how, the anal how the analytical engine could produce music or compose music. Uh, that's just combining two completely, completely different ideas together in a totally silly way, right? Back then. But now we have machines that do it. Um, so what sounds, what sounds really silly might actually be visionary and really important in the future. Now, John von Neumann, who's the father of the modern computer architecture, wasn't, in fact, uh, designing a computer architecture. He was trying to build a model of the brain. Uh, and uh, it's really hard to find that that's the case, but back then, uh, a lot of the cybernetics people were actually just intersection of computers, control systems, biology. Um, there was a group in... in the UK as well, which was sort of, in the UK it happened because during the, the war, uh, everyone who was scientist or something like that was working on the radar controls. And so they got people like biologists and whoever who had to do something with electrics 
together to work on radars and controls. And that sort of fused together biology and early cybernetics. And so John von Neumann, when he talks about what we now call the RAM and the CPU and so on, he doesn't talk about like units or things. He calls them organs. <laughs> um, and that's actually in the, in the report on the design of the computer. And um, I kind of strongly <coughs> suspect that he was actually more interested in modeling the brain than building some sort of machines for the army. Like, what kind of scientist would be interested in building machines for the army when you can model the human brain, right? Um, and so the kind, of, the kind of thing that's interesting in Neumann is that the only trace we have of some of his original ideas are how he names things, the fact that he calls it organs. Um, and um, you can find similar metaphors in, in programming. So if, why do we even call programming languages languages? Like, what, how is it a language? It's sort of mathematical calculus or something like that, maybe? Um, why do we call libraries libraries? Like, I never go to my uh, F-sharp library to get a book from it. Um, and I think there's, there's probably a lot more that you could do if you take ideas from some uh, maybe silly or unrelated area. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking how we could write concurrency abstractions better. And um, one silly idea that I never did anything with was that actually, like, where can we find some inspiration for how people can understand things that happen in parallel? Well, you could, for example, take a look at literature and just look at some stories where multiple things are happening in parallel, and how is that actually written in the book? How, is, how does that, how, how like, that's the, that's the place where people can understand parallelism, right? If you read a book and there's multiple things, multiple storylines, you can understand that this is happening in parallel. Um, so someone, here's a, here's a free idea. Someone should design a programming language that's followed, that's inspired by literature theory. Uh, but I think there's, there's a lot that you can just get from in taking ideas from various random places. Um, and the fact that, yeah? I think the actor model might have said that already. I think the, so I think the actor, the actor model, um, I, I'm not familiar with the sort of origins of it, if it was inspired by some sort of literature or not. Um, it's definitely inspired by the idea that you have multiple, like that's a, that's a beautiful metaphor, having multiple actors. Um, so maybe that's, that's uh, inspired by like theater, but I'm, I'm, I think there's more that you could take from balladry as well. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. I should uh, add the actor model as one of my examples. Yeah, there's, there's a number of metaphors that are inspired by theater. That just shows how, how uh, educated people we are, right? <laughs> but yeah, I think there's, there's, just a, there's just vast amount of ideas for free available everywhere around us that we are ignoring. Um, yeah, and the, the rationalism that we, that we can always trace in the science when we look at it from the current modern perspective, that's just an afterthought. So we know that science is perfect, and when we have the full history, we can trace the right path through it that follows the rational reasoning. Uh, but that's something you can only get in retrospect. Um, and also, the, the perfect rationalist idea, that's what we present in the papers. So if you, um, so in the papers that you're reading, they'll always tell you in the introduction, here's this really important problem, we are going to solve it, then they solve it, and then they say, we solved this really important problem. Uh, but science doesn't really start with problems. Um, if, you, if you start your PhD, you'll just be like playing around with random things. 
doing, yeah, you'll be playing with ideas, um, or you'll just be trying to break something, maybe, or you try to combine two things and see what happens. Um, and that's where a lot of the initial ideas appear, and then we just say, oh, in retrospect, we were actually trying to solve this really important problem. Um, that's what I did in my PhD thesis. <laughs> that's what my advisor told me to do. Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. The, how do you get funded? That's a whole other question. Um, you could... Uh, like, you could try to pretend, well, actually, that's all right, because there's the discovery <coughs> phase and then the justification phase. In the discovery, you can do whatever, but then you follow the nice, nice good method. And in reality, that's really not, that's also not the case, because you just combine the justification with discovery. Like, it's it's way more complicated process. Uh, you'll get ideas from all sorts of random pub discussions, um, and then we present it in a nice rationalist structure. So um, here's my warning. When you're, when you're reading the papers we love, um, they're not telling you the, the whole truth. Um, I think papers are a beautiful format, but they're just the tip of the iceberg where the, the, the ideas get presented in the right form. Um, but that's not really telling you the whole story. Um, there's a really interesting uh, workshop that was uh, at Strange Loop, and they're part of the Splash conference as well, called Future Programming, where when you're, when you're submitting something there, you can actually submit a video or a screencast or some media format. And I find that really interesting um, because it sort of lets you focus on other aspects, and it shows different slice through the, the complex iceberg, not just that, type, that tip, but sort of another tip that's somewhere on the side. Um, so that's one, that's one interesting, um, interesting idea that I think uh, Feyerabend tells us when we, when we look at science. And I always, like since I read the book, whenever I read some paper, I'm, all, I'm, I'm really a lot more careful in reading how they name things because that's pretty much the only place where the initial ideas stay. All right, so um, that's pretty much all I, all I uh, wanted to say about the book. Um, so in summary, I think the, the one thing that's there that's really important is that there's no rule of thumb for distinguishing what's good and what's bad science. Um, we have some... We have some ideas how to distinguish good and bad science um, that sort of work most of the time. Um, and uh, there, are definitely, there are definitely rules for producing good, good science, but um, there's probably a lot of space on the side where people can do things in a different way and still produce something that will be really important in the future. And uh, Feyerabend's epistemolo epistemological anarchism is more likely to encourage progress because it just gives people, or he tries to argue for ways that give people more freedom to explore different ideas, even though some of them will be silly. Um, and um, in an appendix, um, he comments on some of the questions he got after one of his presentations, after his talks, um, where someone said, but if you, if you advocate this idea that just anything goes, how do you even choose what papers you're going to read? Surely you don't read every manuscript that people give you. You throw most of them into the bin. And he says, yeah, I make my selection in a highly individual way, because science needs people who are adaptable and inventive and not rigid imitators of established behavioral patterns. So he just thinks about it. And I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll close with this beautiful image of Paul Feyerabend. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
So this is fire advent not following the established behavioral patterns. Yeah. Now we'll probably have to do the mic. So I'll ask someone to run around with the mic. It sounds an awful lot like improv. Sorry? It sounds an awful lot like improv. Improv? Improv, as in uh, comedians. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, Second City or uh, Saturday Night Live. The idea is anything goes. Uh, continue on a story, the next person carries it on. They should never say no, they should always say yes. So anything goes, and it seems an awful lot like that. Be open-minded. So I think there's definitely, definitely be open-minded. You can still say no if you think what well, the person before you said is silly. Um, it's just, you have to, you, there, it's, much, it's much harder to like, yeah, it's, it's much harder to decide when to say no if you have to do it yourself. <laughs> of course. But, yeah, there's definitely a lot more. Like, he's, he's definitely, I guess he definitely wrote it because he just wanted people to have more freedom when they think about science and explore a lot of ideas. And... He does it partly because he thinks that's better for the people, but um, with the Galileo, that's one example where um, he does it because he thinks that's how science actually worked. Except, um, yeah, <coughs> Galileo got into trouble, and uh, if it was according to his, his method, then Galileo would be all right. Uh, well, do we have another? I think we do have another. Should I turn it on? Probably. Yeah, it works. It does. Yes, right here. Um, I just wanted to answer Gregory's comment. Um, I think there's actually a big difference between being creative and imaginative and making it up as you go along. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that's kind of like what you were hinting at. Um, there's a really famous quote by uh, Edgar Allan Poe that's actually one of my favorites in which he says that uh, truly imaginative are never anything less than analytical. Yeah, and yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point. And he also doesn't say, like, as I was saying in the beginning, anything that goes doesn't mean make, make, make stuff up as you go. It means, yeah, follow some structure but be open to changing the structure you're following. Uh, yes? I'm curious if you see Popper and Feyerabend as totally at odds, or if you think they can get along in some way. Popper and Feyerabend? Yeah, so like, uh, it seems to me like their big ideas, I know Feyerabend was ultimately like very critical of Popper, but their big ideas seem to me sort of orthogonal, right? Like, we can come up with theories in whatever way, crazy ways we want, um, in creative ways, hmm. but ultimately it's only through testing them and refuting some of them that we grow knowledge and that we make progress. Yeah, is there, so is, I do think there's, um, I don't know what, what Popper would say if you came up with something that can't be falsified and you are just like, yeah, I think this is a really good idea and I'm going to keep working on it for a bit. Um, I guess they, you could probably see them as, by being, you could probably see the two, two theories as being able to work together, except that I think Popper was way more strict in his, uh, in his methodology. Like, he would never let you uh, come up with something that's not falsifiable because that's not science. And Feyerabend would, be, uh, would probably say it's part of science. Um, yeah. What would that be? What would Charles Babbage say? Well, I don't know. Um, we'll have to. Um, is there any clear distinction between scientific knowledge and the scientific method? Because this is pretty much what I'm getting from here. I mean, the scientific method, you can apply it to different hypotheses, different theories, and then you can see if it works out. But this is more like step outside of scientific knowledge to come up with whatever you know, crazy theories mm. or silly, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. but then apply the scientific method to actually, like, you know, kind of like a mixed 
uh, you know, how do you reach that? Yeah, is there? Balance? Yeah, um, I guess there's there's all. So you can definitely you can definitely say this is this is like step out of the scientific knowledge, come up with some ideas that then fit the scientific knowledge. Um, I'm not quite sure. Like we, we would have a big trouble defining what scientific knowledge um, is it like is it because it could be all these inconsistent theories, but then they're inconsistent and that's not nice scientific. Um, also, scientific knowledge very often builds on some foundational theory, and then you can refute the, the foundational theory, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everything goes. Um, there's um, another philosopher of science, Ian Hacking, who's actually advocating more, or he's sort of, in, in physics, he's uh, advocating very experimentalist method, where if you build something and it does something, then that's your like one piece of scientific knowledge that can't be refuted. Like if you build a motor, and when you put the wires together, it starts rotating. That's not that doesn't depend on any foundational theory. So that's a solid piece of scientific knowledge. Um, and it doesn't matter what your theory is. You can have multiple inconsistent theories. Um, but I don't quite think that's how how most people think about scientific knowledge. So, what was the name again? Uh, Ian Hacking. I think we're going to go here, here, and then here. Is that me? Ooh, yeah, we do. I uh, didn't get that. We're trying to order, we're trying to order it. No, it's All right. Yeah. Hi, yeah. Um, Where so is that? I'm, I'm here. OK, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I'm kind of wondering, like, in your opinion, who do you think, like, what was his main audience and point he was trying to get across? Because what I heard is, like, this is for people who potentially aren't scientists who have this idea of science as being a rigid thing and he's saying look it's actually really messy and chaotic and you could do mm. it in a way like if you had the stroke of inspiration and yet when you talk about people like Ada Lovelace and her inspirations like she's basically a genius like it, you can't just tell someone oh yeah anything goes because you, then you don't have the constraints within which like mm. creativity tends to flow like we tend to put constraints around things in order to sort of be more creative within those hmm. within that realm. So I'm just wondering, like, obviously you can't tell everyone, like, hey, you'll be, oops, sorry. <laughs> hey, you'll be, like, so much more successful if you just take your inspirations from everywhere, because that's impossible to do. So. Yeah. Um, no, I definitely, like, I definitely agree that um, you can't just tell everyone to do any, everything. Um, and in, in science, there's a lot of like, good ways of doing things. And actually, many people who do science are perfectly happy following the, the good scientific practice. Um, so I wouldn't, like, even if you, even if everyone, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is that even if everyone who does science read Feyerabend and agreed with it, it would only affect a smaller number of people than we might think, because um, there's, there's pretty good ways of doing science that follow the methods that are there, are really fun, you can build a lot of amazing things and come up with great ideas. Um, but. I guess the case with, with Ada Lovelace is that, yes, she was a genius, and because she was able to mix these different ideas together and still write it somewhere and have other people read it, that was really super important. So, hey, this is uh, sort of related to one of the previous questions. Uh, the book seems to be, and I only read a little bit of it, but it seems to be well, it is about how to do science, but it doesn't really address what science is. Like the closest that he really got to it was, I mean, almost verbatim, science is things that scientists do, which is like not satisfying in any way and doesn't really like give you, give you something to like hold up his 
mm. sort of theories against, mm. right? So how, I guess to turn into a question like, what, what sort of notion of science do you think he had? And when you were reading this book, at least which one did you have in mind? And how did you evaluate what he was saying? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. That's probably too good question for me. Uh, <laughs> I suppose you, I, I very strongly suspect you could find at least four books <laughs> trying to answer that question. Um, so what, did, what, what idea of science he could have? I yeah, really I, I don't really have any good idea how to answer it. <laughs> I think, yeah, he was, he was probably think, thinking science is what scientists do. <laughs> um, that's uh, not very satisfying and yeah, there's, there's probably a lot of other books that someone will have to talk about here in the future that are trying to answer the question what, what science is. What came from your talk, though, was the impression that he was railing against the whitewashing or worship of science. You um, used the term perfect and truth when talking about science and the scientific method. And he was countering that, talking about the realism, yeah. and the humanistic yeah. aspect of science. The, yeah. The question was simply, what would he really Are we still doing the things with microphones? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are you sort of? Like that's pr like that's a good point, but it, the, my question was simply, what was he railing against? And he doesn't really say what it was. He just sort of leaves it, leaves you to fill that in for yourself. Well, he implied. Now, you, sorry, not I'm sorry, uh, the yeah. author, not the person yeah. who did a wonderful job. <laughs> <laughs> two, two others. Yeah, no, he was he was definitely against the idea that science is this perfect thing, um, and I think he, in the book, he goes much further than than um, I would want to follow in, uh, in my scientific life. Um, so I guess it, like, partly why I find the book so enjoyable is that it just takes it like, way beyond the point. Um, um, and so he was definitely saying, like when, when he said you can take the ideas from fools and myths and religion, um, he was probably thinking it literally. Um, and I think that's why, like, when the book was published, it was really controversial, and everyone's like, he's just trying to destroy science, get rid of him. Um, and I think that's, like, he's going very far, but I think there's a lot of good thoughts there as well. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for an interesting talk. Um, so I wanted you to just say a little bit more why you think Feyerabend thinks that discovery and justification are intertwined, right? Mm. So for someone like Popper, right, he thinks that they're divorced, mm. and that's why Popper would endorse that you mm, could mm, take mm, mm. to myths, right? But Feyerabend has this deeper thing, so mm. I, I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more yeah. about that. I think it's, it's, it's uh, probably coming from the idea that um, if they were like clearly separate, we would just come up with something, and then uh, that's the the thing we would we would um, we would just test and falsify or not. Um, but I think like when you're when you're coming up with something, you come up with something, then you sort of try to falsify it, but it maybe doesn't quite work, so you change it a bit. And then you actually realize you can measure a different thing. And so you slightly change what you're saying based on what you can measure. Um, so yeah, I think very often, like, at least when like, I, do, I do things in programming languages world, uh, or when people do things in the, like, I'm, I guess we would need more scientists who could, who could give us stories from their own lives. Um, I think in the programming <coughs> languages world, like people very often come up with some idea, but then they end up trying to prove it, and then they have to change it. Um, 
So the, yeah, that's, that's probably as good an answer as I can do. Uh, but um, it would be really cool to have more, have more scientists who could tell us how they do physics. Anyone? We have one, uh, we have one more question. Let me yeah. get a, sorry, again. Hi. Uh, thank you for, for your interesting presentation. Um, if I am not wrong, Paul Graham, in his um, book, Hackers and Painters, states that he doesn't believe computer science is truly a science. Um, I guess there are other people that think so. What is your opinion about it and why? Yeah, uh, there, there's the usual joke that says, if you have to put science in your name, you're not science, right? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Is, is computer science a science? I think it has, well, it's done by scientists, or it's done by people who are. Uh, um, I do think it's science to some extent. Um, it's definitely not physics, right? Because we are not looking at the world and trying to just like m measure and understand what the world does. Although even physics, like once you once you have uh, relativity and your measurements affect the world, you're no science anymore. Um, or I, I do like a few analogies between um, economics and, and computer science because we are both like talking about some world that's sort of there, but as we do it, we are changing it. And uh, we are also both building these beautiful mathematical models that aren't really true. Um, so I did, rec I did recommend another <coughs> book, uh, which is um, sort of related to, to this thinking on economics. It's by a Czech, Czech author, Tomasz Sedlacek. Uh, it's The Economics of Good and Evil. And um, it's kind of interesting in that he's trying to find modern economical ideas in uh, the ancient myths and in the Bible and um, lots of ancient ancient uh, literature. Um, so yeah, that's that's completely derailing the discussion. But that's another good book. All right, uh, we're thankful for all the questions. We'll have more uh, afterward. We want to thank Thomas so much. Thank you.